Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be exploring something from a very famous science fiction book slash movie, something that I've been meaning to make for a very long time. We're going to be exploring Arrakis from the famous novel by Frank Herbert, Dune. But more specifically, I'm going to be focusing on this relatively recent article that as always you can find in the description below that answered a simple question. Could the main planet from Dune, the planet known as Arrakis, actually exist in real life and potentially be the way it's presented in the movie and, of course, in the novel? And this is a type of a topic I used to cover on the channel quite a lot. For example, there's an entire series of different older videos where I tried to recreate various planets from Star Wars and tried to see if they could actually exist in real life as well. And I also did the same with a few other science fiction and fantasy novels, including, of course, the famous Game of Thrones. But in this video, I really wanted to finally focus on Dune, mostly because I just finished watching the movie and it was pretty good. Not as good as maybe the original 1984 version, but still pretty good. And more importantly, because of this recent analysis slash article that basically did a lot of legwork in trying to scientifically determine if such a planet could actually exist. Now, in case you've never watched Dune or in case you've never read the book, well, the premise is really, really interesting. It's probably one of the most engaging science fiction novels in existence. It involves a lot of different topics, including a really important environmental theme, and it's even been referred to as the first planetary ecology novel on a grand scale. But it's also a novel that involves a lot of intrigue, a lot of betrayal, and essentially this unusual planet located approximately 300 light years away from planet Earth that seems to possess these unusual worms that produce unusual psychedelic element. The element or the spice referred to as melange, with the iconic phrase explaining what this is. The spice extends life, the spice extends consciousness, the spice is vital to space travel. Or in other words, it's a drug that seems to transform humans into something entirely different and is the only way humans are able to travel across vast distances in space. So it was actually a really, really cool concept. And the planet known as Arrakis, the desert world with practically no water on the surface, is the only place where you can actually find the spice. But anyway, if you haven't watched the movie yet, or if you've never read the novel, I don't want to spoil the rest because it is pretty fun. And so could such a world really exist somewhere out there around a certain type of a star? First of all, I actually wanted to start with something that's not mentioned in the article. The star itself. And it's one of the brightest and one of the most well-known stars in the night skies. It's a star you see right there, it's known as Canopus, also known as Alpha Carina. Now the thing is, if we jump to the star, you probably quickly realize that it's basically blindingly bright. It's extremely bright, it's also really, really large. It's about 8 times the mass of the sun, let me actually lower the luminosity a little bit, and it's what's known as an A-type star. But it's also only about 25 million years old. The first improbability from the novel is the fact that this planet seems to have some sort of complex life on it. 25 million years is unfortunately not really enough for life to evolve even on a planet like Arrakis. And so this is something that was not actually considered by Frank Herbert back in the days. But planets here are definitely possible, and some of the planets here are going to be extremely hot and be exposed to quite a lot of different types of ultraviolet radiation. Now in the novel, this is the third planet away from the star, so kind of like Earth. But in our simulation in Space Engine, this planet is a little bit too toasty to survive on. The average temperature here is roughly around 2000 degrees Celsius. But naturally some of the farther planets could potentially have the necessary conditions to have just the right temperature. Unfortunately, no planets have been discovered around Canopus to date, but they're probably there, they're just maybe not as easily visible. So in other words, the existence of Arrakis is kind of possible. But how realistic is everything else in the novel? And so the scientists behind this article are actually experts in climate simulations. And to try to simulate all of this, they kept the same fundamental physical laws that create climate and weather here on planet Earth. In other words, they use the models and the simulations that are normally applied to study climate and different types of changes in climate here on planet Earth. For example, by using the link in the description below, you can find this website right here, where the scientists have already simulated various types of changes in climate as our planet evolved in the last 500 million years. So for example, right around here, you can sort of see how the planet looked like in terms of different climatic conditions during the Jurassic era. And so by going through different era, you can see how the climate changed as the continents moved around and as a lot of bodies of water changed in size and shape. 
Then they also have a really interesting and a quite realistic simulation of what might happen to our planet if essentially we don't stop releasing CO2 and if the climate change does not become any better. In this case, they show us what happens to the world if we agree to reduce the emissions of CO2 and a lot of other greenhouse gases, and what happens to the climate on the planet if we sort of ignore all of this and pretend like it doesn't exist. This particular simulation is very, very convincing. And all of this was done by running these simulations for up to about three weeks by running it on a supercomputer. And this time the scientists decided to go in a slightly different direction. They wanted to see what would actually Arrakis look like. And so by using all of the parameters from the novel and also from some of the other sources like um, for example on Wikipedia, they built the model of the planet using its topography, using a very specific orbit mentioned in the novels, and also creating a specific type of an atmosphere as well. In this case, it's somewhat similar to planet Earth in terms of the content of CO2, although the actual CO2 levels here are basically what we used to have in 1950s, so here we're talking about 350 ppm. Unfortunately, today the levels are a little bit higher. But on top of this, they also added a lot more ozone to the planet itself. And so even though on planet Earth, ozone only represents a tiny, tiny fraction of the entire atmosphere, on Arrakis, it's 0.5%. And because ozone is a very, very strong greenhouse gas, this in some sense could explain why Arrakis is so hot and is basically a desert world. Also, one of the potential explanations for how so much ozone was created here is really because of the star itself. The A-type stars in this case produce way more UV radiation, and when the UV radiation in the upper atmosphere interacts with oxygen, it ends up producing ozone. So if there's more UV radiation, and I guess if there's more oxygen, you're going to get a lot more ozone. At least that's my take on this. It's not really explained in the article. And so once all of the parameters were plugged in, and once the supercomputer finished its calculations, they produced this. And turns out that it seems to be an actual planet that could potentially exist, with parts of this planet being potentially habitable. But there were some parts that weren't really adding up. In other words, some parts were basically fantasy or science fiction. And so let's briefly discuss some of this. So first of all, this simulation allows you to look at pretty much every region of the planet and discover what some of the regions here might look like while also providing you with the average temperature in certain parts of the planet. Something that you can also see right here, this was provided by the authors. And interestingly enough, in the warmest month right here in the tropics, the temperature is roughly around 45 degrees Celsius, or about 113 Fahrenheit, whereas the coldest months reach the temperatures of about 15 Celsius or about 60 Fahrenheit. And so here the tropics seem to be quite habitable. And here we're obviously talking about the region relatively close to the equator. You can kind of see in the simulation how the temperature changes. But on the other hand, some of the most extreme conditions in terms of temperature seem to actually occur in the mid-latitudes and the polar regions. With winters being as cold as minus 40 degrees Celsius or minus 40 Fahrenheit, and sometimes even colder, minus 75 Celsius, so kind of similar to what we have in the Antarctica. On the other hand, the summers are extremely hot, up to about 70 degrees Celsius. That's close to about 160 Fahrenheit. So essentially, the summers here would be impossible to survive for any inhabitants on this particular planet. And remember, in the novel, we're talking about regular humans that didn't really evolve much. Yeah, they have these really cool suits that protect them to some extent, but 70 degrees Celsius is still really hot. But in the book, we know that the two major cities are located in the polar regions where the author assumed it would be a little bit cooler, it will, a little bit easier to survive. Turns out the simulations show us the opposite. It looks like it would be much easier to survive on the equator, not really in the polar regions. And that's actually a little bit surprising, it's a little bit counterintuitive. And I guess the next question is, why is this happening? Because that's also kind of opposite of what we find on planet Earth. Well, the answer becomes a little bit more apparent if we start investigating what happens to moisture on Arrakis. There's not a lot of moisture, but there's some. On Arrakis, as you can see from these clouds right here, there is just significantly more moisture in the polar regions compared to the equator. And there are also a lot more clouds here as well. And all of this water vapor acts as a very potent greenhouse gas, warming up certain regions more than other regions. And even though the book says there is no rain on Arrakis and water is extremely difficult to find, this particular model suggests otherwise. It still produced just a little bit of rain and just a few clouds here and there. Although in this particular case, there would be only certain regions where rain would occur, for example, in the mountains. 
At the same time, the book suggests that there were actually polar caps on this planet as well, especially in the polar regions. Or basically that there was permanent ice. But this model definitely suggests that these polar caps could not possibly exist. Even though it gets cold in the North Pole right here, it does also get extremely hot in the summer. So the polar caps would just not survive for the whole year and it would be impossible to produce large caps because the temperature here shifts pretty much every single year. Okay, well, despite these small differences, the planet is still habitable, especially in the equatorial regions. And these tropics would be able to provide just the right conditions for a lot of different life to survive here. Although by traveling a little bit to the north or a little bit to the south, in certain locations in the lowlands here, the future humans might actually find themselves in very inhospitable conditions, and the farther they go, the more extreme it becomes. On top of this, interestingly, on this planet, outside of tropics, outside of the equatorial region, the winters become really extreme, but in the tropics, the winters are more or less mild and the actual conditions are more or less pleasant. But the two cities mentioned in the novel, known as the Arakin and Carthag, would most likely be extremely difficult to survive in. Here this would be very 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 cold in the winter and extremely hot in the summer. The authors actually compare it to some of the cities in Siberia for example, where the conditions are just too extreme. Obviously it's possible to survive, but they would not really be major cities like the ones we see in the novel and in the movies. But naturally you also have to remember that this novel is pretty old. It was originally written back in 1965 and this is before we had these really advanced models or these advanced simulations or before scientists even knew how to model climate changes. And so for a novel that's several decades old, this is actually pretty good. And so to answer that first question of whether Arrakis could be habitable and if humans could survive here, the answer does seem to be yes and a planet like Arrakis could definitely exist. But whether it could exist around Canopus, an A-type star that's about 25 million years old, that's of course another question. Here the answer would probably be no. Or even if the planet exists, it's not really going to have the complex life that we find in a novel. It probably has to be a little bit older for all of this to happen. And so definitely a really interesting article that I suggest you explore by yourself and a really really cool simulation that you can also find in the description below. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. And either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.